Okay, good morning, everyone. And welcome to STL History Live, peering inside the 1904 World's Fair. My name is Aaron Pelker. I'm a community engagement coordinator with the Missouri History Museum's Public History Department. And I wanna thank you for spending part of your Tuesday morning with us. Before we get to our presentation, I do have a couple of brief remarks. I do wanna mention that both the Missouri History Museum in Forest Park and the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum in downtown St. Louis are both open to the public from Wednesday through Sunday. Your safety is, of course, a top priority, and we would love for you to visit if you feel comfortable doing so. Advanced free reservations are required to visit both locations, but please visit mohistory, mohistory.org to plan your visit and reserve your free tickets. Also, I do want to thank our museum members and the Zoo Museum Tax District for their generous support for both our exhibits and our programming. We wouldn't be able to host programs like this morning without their contributions. Lastly, before I turn it over to our presenter for this morning's program, I do want to explain a few of the features you'll find on Zoom that might be helpful. Uh, first, this will be about a 45 minute presentation with some time at the end for our presenter to answer a few questions. You can submit your questions for our speaker at any time through the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. We're also happy to offer closed captioning through Zoom. To enable closed captioning, simply click the CC button on your Zoom toolbar. And finally, at the conclusion of the program, we hope you'll complete a short survey that will open automatically in your internet browser. So we appreciate and look forward to your feedback. With that, I wanna turn it over and introduce our speaker this morning, Carl Kent III, to present Peering Inside the 1900 World's Fair. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, we um, were asked uh, some time ago, uh, my wife and I and Max Storm, to go over to the Missouri History uh, Research Library and they had a bunch of glass plate negatives and I digitized these. And most uh, uh, of the uh, images you're gonna see are from the glass plate negatives that they have in their collection. So let's get uh, started. Um, okay, so if, if we wanted to visit all of the exhibits and all the buildings on the fairgrounds or 75 miles we would have, we would have to walk. Uh, to or to see them all. So we're going to be doing this in 45 minutes. Let's get going. Uh, this was a, a gigantic billboard around the uh, country uh, inviting people to the man's greatest achievement, the World's Fair in St. Louis. Um, you can email me your questions or chat them to uh, the um, chat thing and I'll get them and I'll put them on my web page, which is down here. You can get that from my a phone call as well. And so your answers that we don't get to will be answered uh, on that website. Uh, this was the song that was sung by many people um, that were getting ready to come to the uh, World's Fair. Um, when Louis came home to the flat, he hung up his coat and his hat. He gazed all around, but no wifey he found. So he said, where can Flossie be at? A note on the table he spied. He read it just once and he cried. It ran, Louis, dear, it's too slow for me here. So I think I will go for a ride. And then of course, the rest of it, you know, me being St. Louis. At the end of this program, if we have time, we'll maybe try to sing that together. So this is the main uh, uh, center of the World's Fair in 1904. That's Art Hill. And that is Festival Hall. And uh, at night, it was lit up. These are lights on all of these pillars that you see uh, along the left-hand side, and um, there were lights all over uh, the World's Fair itself. And so at night, the lights would be turned on, and then this would be the view you would have had, and those lights would be changing colors as well. Edison was the one who was chosen to electrify the World's Fair, and his company uh, was in charge of the generators on the fairground. There were all kinds of canals and boats that you were able to uh, 
used to get around the, uh, to the various exhibits. Everyone that came to the Missouri building would sign a guest registry book. And so here are some signatures and I've digitized just about all of these books and we are transcribing them. And so um, if you had someone you think went to the World's Fair, um, we might have their signature. You can see um, they wrote down the location where they came from. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this was a, like one of the cameras was used uh, to take the, um, the negative. These would be the holders for the glass plate negatives. Uh, this is what they look like when they were processed. And then uh, we have turned them into uh, positives for your viewing enjoyment. Here's a statue being moved into place by the work, workers. <coughs> also, there were um, four negatives I found that were um, taken from the uh, tower on the fairgrounds, the, the telegraph tower, and uh, I noticed that they could be overlapped, and so uh, we put these we put these into a panorama for you to view. There were 1,200 acres. Um, uh, there were uh, 1,500 buildings connected by 75 miles of roads and walkways. Uh, impossible to really view everything in less than a week. And the Palace of Agriculture alone was covering 20 acres. And so here I'm going to zoom in on this panorama. This was a Lindell entrance, uh, Lindell Boulevard going along um, the uh, upper portion of this. And this was a model city. Uh, King Louis statue was over here by Lindell. Later it was uh, converted into uh, bronze and put up on top of our hill. So we're going to swing across the whole fairgrounds here to show you uh, the, uh, the total fair area all the way over toward what is now 40 Highway. So 40 Highway would be running up here in the way in the far left. And uh, there was a, a, a gigantic uh, hotel over there inside in where people stayed. Now we'll zoom back over the other way. And you can see uh, that is the art museum, the only building standing in all of this that you've seen. Um, the uh, birdcage is still standing, but this is the only real building standing. Uh, the art museum, you can see how it's dwarfed by this gigantic structure in front, Festival Hall, and this is Art Hill in the front, Ferris Wheel up in the right-hand corner, which is over, which was over by uh, Lindell, by Lindell Boulevard. And then we're going to see a couple other arrows pointing up at where Washington University is in the scene, and also. Uh, that is the uh, City Hall in University City. Which way is north, south, east, and west? So west is up, and left is south, and right is north, and toward me is east. So this is a, another picture of Festival Hall. And the gondolas were brought from Venice with real gondoliers. And uh, Festival Hall contained the world's largest organ. You can see how large this structure was by the people walking up Art Hill on the steps. And you could pay to have a, a ride on, a, on one of the gondolas. This is the uh, birdcage under construction. It's exactly where, uh, in this picture, where it is now in, um, in Forest Park, in the zoo. You can see that um, they have no uh, safety harnesses on. Safety conditions back then were not what they should have been. And there were some who were injured. And a few people did die during the construction of the fair. Uh, here is the construction process. Um, men up on top of the building, uh, putting um, some of the staff in place. Staff was 
plaster paris and horsehair combination, and it was what covered the wooden structures. Here they are uh, bringing up a big piece of it to uh, um, uh, tack on to the uh, front of the building. And again, a, a view from uh, looking at Festival Hall toward uh, the, uh, where the art museum is located. And some of the statuary that was populating the whole fairground. Another view of Festival Hall and a bandstand uh, where bands would be playing, and there were many of these throughout the fairgrounds. So live bands were playing throughout, throughout the fair. And you can see that uh, the, the seats that were lined up along the lagoon because they had uh, parades of floats and uh, boats, uh, and people would come and gather and watch and listen to the bands that were also on those boats playing. Festival Hall, and this was a, a glass dome. There were uh, you know, stained glass windows up here, uh, letting in light. Once again, a little view of uh, what Art Hill looked like in 1904. Again, the uh, lagoons, and you can see the Ferris wheel off in the background down one of the canals. And some men that are kind of watching for the next boat to come along, I suppose. And there's that Ferris wheel. More about that later. King Louis statue uh, was made of staff and plaster of Paris uh, combination. Uh, there were statues in front of the um, of King Louis uh, that uh, were not recast into bronze. And here's a close-up picture of what they look like. Here uh, again is another scene by one of the lagoons and a woman that's about to get on one of the boats for a boat ride. Stepping on there. Somebody should be holding that for her, I think. And the gondolers waiting for passengers. And this is the East India building. It was over by Washington University. You can see the men getting in one of the towers to go walk down the stairs. Some of the women dressed in their best clothing. Didn't come to the World's Fair dressed in your dungarees. In fact, here's some fashion at the fair. This is uh, the wife of the uh, governor of Illinois. And they're dressed in their best clothes. Also, another thing about hats. A lot of hats, women, men all wearing hats. One thing about the men's hats, you can see all men wearing about the same, but you'll never see in all the pictures I'm showing you two women's hats that are identical. They're all unique. More about that later. In fact, here's a picture of opening day. Um, you'll notice no loudspeakers. They had to speak up really loudly for the crowd to hear them. And uh, when I looked at the uh, hats, I examined all the hats the women were wearing in this picture. I could not find two identical hats at all. All of them unique and different. Now here is uh, the, um, the floral clock, which is over where Wydown Boulevard meets uh, uh, over there, uh, 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 Skinker. This is a gigantic floral clock. See how large the hands are compared to the people. A bell would ring on the hour. And there was a big sundial here too that would be tipped over. Statuary on the fairgrounds, uh, gobs of it, uh, thousands and thousands of statues. Some of them were replicas of each other in different positions. Here's some men putting some of the statuary on top of the electric building. Again, you see no safety harnesses. You can see the statues were in pieces and then they were plastered together once they were in, in place in some situations. Here's a man that's making a, a blow up 
the larger version of the uh, statue of Atlas. One of the statues was uh, representing a, a, a terrible coal mine disaster in Illinois, uh, and the women and the children came to see if their husband survived, uh, the father survived, and this was a, a moving statue that's still uh, positioned in a um, uh, Lincoln Park up near Chicago, Illinois. It's been converted into limestone. The giant statue inside um, in, from Alabama. Now we're inside of uh, palaces, to peering inside of them, and you could actually buy some of this um, Italian sculpture uh, from within this particular palace and you could uh, put in an order for it. For example, here are some tickets down below here. Um, people put their names on them. They wanted to purchase that particular item. And you can look around and see other tags on some of the others. Smithville uh, History Museum uh, told me that they have one of these statues on top of one of their buildings in Smithville, Missouri. Varied industry, one of the more popular palaces to go into and peer inside of. And out front, there was a very peculiar object. We'll get in closer to it. It's a scale. Yeah, a scale that you could stand on to get your weight, but a unique scale. Here it is inside the building. I speak your weight for five cents. And it tells you, you stand on it, you can't be more than 250 pounds, and it will announce your weight out loud for all those around you to enjoy hearing um, how much you weigh on that day at the World's Fair. From what I understand, it was one of the very few concessions that lost money at the World's Fair. Uh, the Waterman uh, Company had their fountain pens on display. You could buy a fountain pen and join the Dip No More Society. Dip no more. No more dipping your pen. And on the top, there was a stained glass window dome. You could buy skates from Holland. You could buy uh, all kinds of statuary from the Bailey Company of Detroit. And uh, the uh, Winkle Terracotta Company had their terracotta on display. You could also view tapestries uh, from uh, the, uh, these were made for the residents of the CM Schwab Esquire, New York. And uh, you could uh, see these in full color. Of course, we have no color photographs from back then, but. This would have been in full color, these tapestries. And in Switzer Switzerland's visit uh, uh, exhibit, you could actually purchase uh, wood carvings that were on display. And the Sonnenberg Toy Company had all kinds of toys that you could put in orders for. Pull toys, dolls, and life-size toys, a giant camel and uh, horses. And then the Buster Brown Shoe Company had a display and you could actually go in, be measured for your shoes and the shoes would be made in the factory that they had inside of this building. And you could pick them up later uh, during the week or that later that day. And Buster Brown was there actually um, with his dog. The French had their wonderful gowns on display, and you could put in orders for these French gowns as well. And the French also had toys and games on display.
and a Bissell uh, sweeping company had their sweepers on display. Notice how unique this is. The gigantic roof was a giant Bissell sweeper uh, with a, a small, the regular size sweepers all around decorating. And inside, they actually had a robot a wind-up robot that would push one of their sweepers and show you how clean that um, particular sweeper could make your carpet. And the Savage Rifle, David Savage had a rifle company uh, that where you could buy rifles and you could actually, they had a shooting range on the fairgrounds where you could try out your rifles as well. And they had a robot there too. They had a replica of a Native American, and this Native American would lift up the rifle and pull the trigger, um, and uh, a cap would go off. And uh, we also have this interesting display by the King Cutter Company. Everything, if you can imagine, it was in movement. All those um, saws were spinning around, and uh, you can see the giant um, scissors and knife. Those are about six to seven feet in length and uh, would actually be moving up and down, up and down, open and closing. And they had a chainmail fountain with a chainmail moving up and down. And then you could look at a modern shower bathroom and take a look at this shower. Look at all the handles there, all these uh, uh, nozzles squirting you. You you couldn't help but get clean by standing inside of that shower. I don't think they demonstrated it at the fair, but you could purchase it. And then, of course, uh, we have the uh, Victor Company, the talking machine with the dog uh, listening uh, to his master's voice. And uh, we um, have the uh, uh, Edison had records with Meet Me in St. Louis on these wax cylinders that you could actually listen to. Meet Me in St. Louis, Louis, sung by Billy Murray, Edison Records. When Louis came home to the flat, he hung up his cup. And so that was actually a recording off of that wax cylinder. And the Underwood Company had their typewriters on display, and you could actually try them out and make a purchase. So the World's Fair was kind of like a giant shopping mall uh, where uh, all these people from all over the world, companies had uh, their items on display. This was very interesting uh, display because look at the uh, stained glass glow. Uh, that would glow at night when they would light it up. And the uh, con company had their musical instruments on display. You could try them out. Um, you could uh, have an organ concert next door, and you could actually uh, purchase for yourself a, a clarinet, a saxophone, whatever instruments they had there. And the Chinese had all sorts of um, carved um, furniture and ceramics. They had uh, boats that you could purchase in the background there. And uh, Funk and Wagnall had their famous encyclopedia. When I was growing up, we all had one of these. Look it up in your Funk and Wagnall. And uh, so you could buy a Funk and Wagnall, order one there. There were telescopes on display, and you could purchase one. And someone told me that you could actually um, look at night uh, at the stars through some of those exhibits. And then the largest photograph in the whole world at that point, the 72 feet long taken by the Whirly brothers. Um, and uh, it's kind of on an angle from where the photographer took the picture. So I straightened it out so you could see it better. And there it is uh, in Switzerland. They went up to the Swiss Alps. And I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. So you can see 72 feet long. And uh, the, uh, oh, the negatives at the um, St. Louis Library had, not the History Museum, but the library had uh, stored in a basement. Some of them got water damage. That's what happened to this one. 
But the reason I'm including it is because when the photographer took this picture, he didn't realize the disaster that was actually happening when he snapped the shutter. Let's zoom in on the disaster. Yes, one of the gondolas was sinking and they were trying to rescue it at that very moment. And then a parade of floats. Um, the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company uh, made uh, movies uh, with a handheld crank machine that would allow them to uh, make motion pictures. And so here's a brief clip out of one of these. And each country had a float. And on the floats, on the boats, uh, they had musicians playing their music from uh, their country. And uh, as these go by, you can see the uh, Festival Hall uh, cascades in the background. But each country had a float and had um, uh, instruments on there. And they were playing and people would uh, sit around the lagoon and listen uh, to all the music that was being played uh, by the various musicians on these floats. And in a short while, I believe you'll see the one from Scotland. Yeah, bagpipes being played. This uh, festival hall had the world's largest organ in it. Um, it was gigantic. It still is the world's largest organ. No organ has been made them that has been larger. And it's on display in Philadelphia. And the departments are there. You can still hear it play. But um, this gigantic uh, organ um, was housed underneath this dome. When they opened it up loud the first time they played it, plaster of Paris fell down from the ceiling onto the people. No one was hurt, but they couldn't open it up as loud as they wanted to after that. Here's a pipe uh, from uh, seven, 32 feet long, and they had a pony before it was put together pose inside this gigantic pipe. And here's the console with a, friend, a famous French organist that came and played for the audiences. And this is a picture of that organ. And then inside the Palace of Agriculture, there was all kinds of wine that you could taste and canned goods that you could um, order and you could try out and purchase. And uh, my favorite display in the Palace of Agriculture, we're inside it here, is the, uh, the puffed rice display. Let me zoom in on that. And you can see uh, there's like a little cannon here that would shoot the rice into this cage and it would puff it. And then you could get a free bag of puffed rice, a small free bag. Unfortunately, they forgot to put trash cans inside the Palace of Agriculture. And I believe all those little white things are the empty um, puffed rice bags that people just dropped inside the palace. And inside the palace, you could get a free piece of watermelon, possibly. Um, and um, one of the interesting things that they would give free slices away at the um, Gulch on Gulch Day, August 31st, after 1 p.m. And also, fantastic as it sounds, 20 men feast on one Texas watermelon and some is left over. The Lone Star State sends 12 specimens weighing 1,185 pounds. And Missouri had the biggest cheese, full cream cheese, weighed two tons in the Palace of Agriculture. Unfortunately, the refrigeration broke down one night and the cheese smelled to high heaven, and they had to close the Palace of Agriculture uh, until they could air it out for a day or so. And then the Post and Food Company had a very interesting display. You probably didn't know that Postum uh, can do all of this for your brains. I'm going to uh, zoom in on some of this here um, and uh, show this to you. Uh, sturdy brain win. There is one true scientific brain food, grape nuts. Yeah, brain food. You can feel well again by leaving off coffee and using postum food coffee. Possible to grow a stronger set of brains. Certain results from grape nuts food. A set of brains. That's what I need. I need another one. 
Oh, yeah. And it says also um, you can uh, possibly grow, um, well, thousands drink post co food coffee and get well from diseases caused by ordinary coffee. So maybe during the pandemic, we should have been going out there and buying some posted food coffee. I don't know. And uh, Jello was sold, uh, all kinds of flavored Jellos. And uh, also, probably the hottest selling um, beverage um, was hot grape juice. Yeah, Fremont grape juice. Uh, you could get a nice hot cup of grape, grape juice. And then all kinds of restaurants all over the fairgrounds, the Blatz, the Blatz Pavilion and the uh, Bohemia Restaurant. They had a theater in there. So while you were eating, you could watch a play. And then uh, the largest uh, restaurant that I know of was this one. Uh, it was huge. It was on Lindell Boulevard. And uh, you could go inside and look at all the seats there. Uh, probably a thousand people could be seated and no air conditioning, but they had these giant fans that they had going to keep you cool. And so uh, I animated a couple of the fans so you could see what it would have been like to be sitting beneath them there in this giant, um, giant restaurant. And they had restaurants inside the uh, palaces as well. And you could eat upstairs in some of them. And uh, you could purchase ice cream. Um, ice cream cones, uh, waffle cones, were invented at the World's Fair, from what I understand. Um, and people uh, that ran out of the uh, paper uh, cups for the, uh, the uh, ice cream were next to a, a waffle man, and he was able to give them some waffles to make waffle cones. And then the Pike, Lindell Boulevard, uh, from Skinker to De Bolivar, a mile-long entertainment section of the World's Fair. There's Ireland way down at the end. And those are fake mountains. Uh, they look like mountains, but they were actually made out of wood and painted and uh, just looked like... A... Oh, and Jim Key, we're going to hear more about him on the Pike. And there were uh, parades promptly at 6 p.m. And the largest Ferris wheel, observation wheel, 60 persons in one of its cars, 32 cars, 45-minute ride. Marriages were held in the cars, some of them on horseback. And here's a picture of that giant Ferris wheel. We'll zoom in a little bit. 60 people could be in one of those cars. A little closer view of some of the carriages. And a controversial thing were the incubators on the pike. Um, incubators were a new thing and they weren't permitted in the hospitals then that day. Uh, but the um, uh, fair, uh, fair um, governor said you can have them on the pike. And little preborn children were actually brought uh, to the fairgrounds. Some of them survived because of the incubators. Some did not, but it was a new technology on exhibit. And uh, Battle Abbey had uh, battles being reenacted uh, with ships and other kinds of battles being reenacted inside of the um, exhibit. And here's a Jim Key's um, uh, exhibit being uh, constructed here. Um, you can see up in the upper right, the educated horse Beautiful Jim Key, uh, the most wonderful horse in the world. And here's a ticket. Opening performances of beautiful Jim Key. He reads, writes, spells, counts, figures, changes money using the National Cash Register, um, even gives Bible quotations. Um, the educated horse on the pike. And here he is with his rack. And he would actually, if you said your name, go over and pick up the letters and put them on a spelling rack. So uh, Harvard professors came and challenged this. And no one was in the booth with uh, Jim except them. And he was able to spell their names. There's a monument to him um, over in Kentucky um, where he's buried. And he was taken around 
uh, to the um, public schools and participated in spelling bees. And this is Bilkey, the man that trained him. He's a former slave. He was a horse whisperer, a dog, um, dog and horse trainer. And he um, uh, told, he, they asked him how he trained this horse to do that. He told them how, and he said, with kindness. The Humane Society then asked uh, Bill if he would take um, Jim around um, the country and promote humanity toward animals. And he did that as well. And um, Bill, from what I understand, made over a million dollars with this horse uh, by taking him around to various venues. Uh, the Temple of Mirth was on the, on the, um, uh, the pike as well and entitled you to the courtesies of the Akon Mu Amusement Company. This is a picture of it, the Temple of Mirth. Now, I would not have gone in there for this reason. I read this, that when you went in, there was a chair that you were to sit on. And they said, now you sit on this chair and uh, look in the mirror there and you're going to be laughing your fool head off in just a second. So you'd sit on the chair. The, uh, the legs were made with springs on them. You'd fall on your duff and the curtain would open and all the people that preceded you falling on their duffs would be laughing their fool heads off at you. Um, a lot of things like that in the Temple of Mirth, things that you, they couldn't get away with today. And I, I just would hesitate to recommend you go in there if you do any time travel. Uh, well, remember in the song, Meet Me in St. Louis, she said, we'll dance the hoochie coochie. Some people think this is the hoochie coochie. It was filmed on the pike. And um, let's take a look at this dance. Well, I'm not sure I would dance to Uchi Kuchi now that I've looked at that, but as long as there was a dentist nearby, I guess we could try it. Now, also, um, in the um, area of the pike, there were a uh, possibility to get a, a donkey ride or a camel ride. And these um, were uh, persons that were brought here uh, from uh, the Middle East, and they were able to um, show you how they did uh, uh, they had uh, donkey barbers that would carve various things into the fur of the uh, donkeys. And this was a demonstration that was being done. Uh, so you can see uh, carving some kind of symbol into the fur of the donkey. Still being done actually over in Egypt today. And uh, you would be able to get a ride for 10 cents, camel rides for 20 cents. You buy your tickets here. And here's one of the tickets that was for sale. And uh, you could also, uh, in the streets of Cairo, uh, get a, um, uh, some, a cup of tea. And this was a tea vendor. And you'll notice he's got his uh, tea uh, backpack on there and he's pouring tea in one glass. They only had one glass. But you would get your tea and, um, and then they would, I guess, give that same glass to the next person. Not a good idea during a pandemic, but nevertheless, that's the way it was done. And um, there are similar vendors today. If you go to Cairo, they carry very similar backpacks like this and uh, will give you, but they do have disposable cups. One thing I've always wondered about was this particular cigar. What happened when it got down to where there's a spiral? Um, I, I wonder what it what happened there? Uh, 
And then there were magicians on the pike as well. And this one, from what I understand, would stand there with an egg on his nose or pull an egg out from somewhere, put it on his nose and say, watch this. And then as you watched, it would hatch on his nose and a little chicken uh, would come out um, of, the, uh, of the egg and he would catch it and then show you the little chick. And you'd pay him something. And then the city of Jerusalem was reconstructed, the old city, in St. Louis next to the uh, art museum. This is a diagram of it. And um, the people that lived there were brought from Jerusalem. Uh, they were Christians, Jews, and Muslims that were brought and lived in the old city that you could go in and meet them. And so here's a picture of the old city of Jerusalem. You can see Festival Hall over there in the, on the right in the art museum would be a little bit more to the right. And uh, you could go inside the city of Jerusalem and get a, a, a donkey ride um, throughout the, um, the uh, city of Jerusalem. And here's another picture of it in situ. You can see uh, the word Jerusalem on the wall and uh, you can see Festival Hall in the background there. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, Ferris wheel in the background, the festival hall would have been um, behind us. And here are some more people uh, that are in the old, uh, it's David Street in the old city, and they would have uh, instrumentals that you could listen to and get a camel ride to. And then Helen Keller came to the World's Fair. Um, this is a snapshot of Helen Keller uh, and her tutor, Ms. Sullivan. Um, and they had a Helen Keller Day uh, that was um, in October of uh, October 19th. And Helen Keller said that soul, not sense, makes life worth living. And she wanted a camel ride. And so uh, after leaving the Alps, uh, the party went through mysterious Asia. And Miss Keller said she wanted to ride a camel. And after some remonstrance, on the part of Miss Sullivan, she was placed on one of the animals with a gentleman seated behind her, and she laughed heartily at the peculiar movement of the big beast as he walked along and seemed to enjoy this part of the program immensely. And inside the exhibits in the palaces, uh, the blind had exhibits as well demonstrating um, the work that they could do, though they were blind, making brooms here with special broom machines. And an exhibit also of them learning with Braille. And there were a, a pair of twins who played the violins that were blind and they gave exhibits and concerts as well that you could go to. And then of course at night, the uh, fairgrounds were lit up uh, with lights changing. We have to imagine it changing from this color to a green and red, and I think blue as well. And Edison had electrified this whole and yeah, most people coming to the World Fair in 1904 from the country areas didn't have electricity. So this was just an amazing um, experience. At the top of our screen, you can see the large Palace of Agriculture that was over a long Skinker Boulevard. And on the far right, the um, Ferris wheel was lit up as well. And as we zoom in on Festival Hall, the Art Museum is not lit up. It's behind there. You can see it to the left a little bit. And then also the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Tower. This was a ticket to go up in the tower itself to get a good view. That panorama view that you saw was the uh, pictures taken from that uh, wireless tower. And so here is that tower. And uh, those photographs of the panorama were taken from way up there. But there were also couples that wanted to get married on top, not just of the Ferris wheel, but also got married on top of the DeForest Wireless Tower. And so uh, here's a couple that um, 
had their pictures taken way up there at the top of the tower. And uh, there they are, hand in hand. And I think it had something to do with, you know, the higher you got married, the more likely your marriage was going to last. I, I don't know. I have no idea why going up high and getting married was something special. But again, the the tower and the couple way up to the top. Um, also, there were um, headphones you could wear, and there were radio broadcasts, um, so you could listen to music with these headphones throughout the fairgrounds. And one uh, one source said that you could actually talk to someone, so there were cell phones on the uh, that you could rent. And again, the panorama that was taken from that wireless tower. That tower, by the way, uh, the wired tower, was over where the History Museum is now. Not, not right there, but um, a little bit further to the east. Twelve fifteen hundred buildings and twelve twelve hundred square miles. The world's largest fair never to have been surpassed in terms of size and the number of exhibits. Again, the art museum behind Festival Hall on Art Hill. And now we come to the end of our program and I wanted to have you uh, try to sing a part of this but I'm going to be running out of time but I do want to show you that there were fireworks at the end of the fair and closing day the fair was held from um, April 30th to December 1st uh, and uh, on December 1st that evening there were fireworks uh, and uh, people sang um, Auld Lang Syne uh, probably didn't sing Meet Me in St. Louis but And so then what happened, of course, is the, um, the fair had to be torn down. And in the winter of um, December um, 1904, uh, the buildings were all torn apart, except for the art museum and the bird cage. And uh, uh, some people wonder why it was torn down. The buildings were made out of temporary staff and wooden structures. And so uh, goodbye to the World's Fair of 1904. Okay, Carl, I know uh, you have some obligations after this program, but we do have a couple of questions if you have, a, if you have time to answer. Sure, uh, I, I should say something before I answer though. Um, I always have an answer for every question. And no matter what it is, but sometimes I make up the answers. And if I do make up an answer, though I'm honest about it, at the end of it, I'll say I made that one up. So, okay. <laughs> well, our first question is from uh, uh, Kim Young in our audience. She asks, how long did it take to construct the fair complex? What happened to all the statues, stained glass, and architectural elements? 
Okay, well, first of all, um, the, um, a lot of the objects uh, were um, sold. There was like a, se a sell-off at the end of the fair uh, so that uh, you could come on the fairgrounds and buy many of the different things that were there. Um, and uh, so that's one thing that happened, a lot of the objects. Uh, most of the statuary was torn down um, and uh, so it wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't maintained or, or kept. And actually by December, some of it was uh, splitting apart because of the cold, you know, the freezing and the thawing and so on. Um, it took, as far as I know, uh, the fair was supposed to open in um, 1903 to celebrate the Louisiana Purchase from 1803, but it could, it, they couldn't get it done, so they had to postpone it a year. And I think um, the starting of the construction, if we go way back in time, might have been 1900. Um, uh, a little bit before that or a little after that. Uh, I'm not sure about that part. But uh, And then um, what ex what's left of the statuary? Well, King Louis, that statue was sent up to Chicago and cast in bronze and brought back to St. Louis. I think in 1909, it was established on the top of Art Hill. Uh, some of the other statuary, I mentioned Smithville. There's a house in Smithville that has a, a statue of Apollo on top of it that was purchased at the World's Fair. Uh, Smithville is out near Kansas City. And so they have that object in uh, the big statue of Vulcan uh, from um, uh, Alabama, that's down there in uh, Birmingham, I believe that that's down there. So there are some things that survived uh, the fair as well. We have another question uh, they ask, the art museum appears to be further back in the hill. Uh, where the festival was. Can you discuss landscape changes? Uh, what was the first part of that again? She, uh, the question was, the art museum appears to be further back than the hill where the festival was. Can you discuss landscape changes? Well, actually, the art museum is exactly where it was in 1904. It hasn't been moved. Um, what, what looks like um, there are some landscape changes is this. Fest, if you go to fest, go to Art, um, Art Hill and you know where King Louis is, right? Okay, Festival Hall would have, um, the beginning of Festival Hall would have been down Art Hill, maybe about, oh, I would say 25%. So it was actually on Art Hill itself as well as um, toward the top of Art Hill. It was um, just an amazing structure. And... Um, so where King Louis is, the uh, festival hall would have been uh, would have been partly there. Um, we didn't see the back of our, of a festival hall, but there were entrances back there, um, and then the uh, the roadway that goes um, in front of the art museum would have been a pathway between the back end of festival hall and uh, the art museum. So that's about the best I can describe it. I think. And then we have one last question for you, Carl. We'll get you out on this one. And this is from our friend, Mike Truex on the World's Fair Society. He says, Carl, great program and commentary as always, right on. Uh, his question is, are these images the same ones that are on the MHS website or are the scans you made higher resolution? Well, uh, the scans that um, are up on the Missouri history site and also on the St. Louis um, uh, City Library site uh, are not the highest resolutions that are available. Uh, and that is partly because of the web, you know. Um, and uh, so some of the images that I use today um, are a little bit higher, a lot higher resolution um, than those that uh, you can download from those sites. Um, and part of the reason uh, that I used those is I wanted to zoom in on some of the detail and, um, you know, the bits, so many bits per inch, you know, you've got to have a little uh, more pixels per inch to get a little bit less grainy um, uh, exhibits. So, yeah, some of those were um, higher resolution. And he, I'll just, uh, he had a little addendum to that. And he asked if there was any up plans to upgrade the MHS images uh, to make them higher resolution. And uh, unfortunately, I can't speak too much on, on that front. Uh, most of those sorts of uh, 
Things are handled by our library and research center staff, our great staff over at the LRC, which is unfortunately still closed to the public uh, due to the pandemic. Hopefully that will open soon. They still do take questions though uh, via their website. So if you go to the mohistory.org website, you can easily find the library and research website. And uh, I do encourage you to direct those sorts of questions uh, to our wonderful staff over there. Um, but I think uh, that is our last question. So I okay. do want to thank uh, Carl again for that fascinating look at the 1904 World's Fair. Um, I do want to mention that we have our regularly scheduled STL History Live programs on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m., as well as Soldiers Memorial Challenge Chats on select Wednesdays at noon. You can see a couple of the upcoming programs on this slide. And you can find links for all our upcoming programs at mohistory, mohistory.org, or on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. So please be sure to check out that lineup. And also, please don't forget to fill out the survey and let us know what you thought about our program today. So thanks again for joining, and we will see you next time. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everybody.